And now for the fourth and final branch of the Mabinogion, the story of Blodewith. Math the magician, Lord of Gwynedd, needed a maid to care for him. Arianrod, sister of Gwydion the wizard, went to see him at his court in Cairdathel. I'd make you a good maid, she said. Math looked into her blue eyes. Do you have any children, he asked. I don't want a woman with children. I have none, Arianrod replied. That was a lie. Arianrod had two sons. One was old enough to leave home, but the other was a small baby. The baby was hidden in a chest at the foot of her brother Gwydion's bed. If you have no children, then you shall be my maid, Math said to her. That very day, Arianrod joined Math at court and forgot all about her little boy. Early next morning, Gwydion was woken by a baby's cry. In the chest, his nephew was wriggling and throwing aside the sheets. Gwydion picked him up and went in search of a nursemaid, because he couldn't take the boy to his mother. The boy grew very quickly in the nursemaid's care. At the age of one, he could run and talk like a two-year-old. When he was two, he could wander around on his own. Gwydion was proud of his nephew and loved him dearly. When the boy was four, he looked like an eight-year-old and Gwydion decided to take him to Caer Arianrod, where his mother had made her home. Arianrod greeted them both with a warm smile. Gwydion, how good to see you, she said. And who's this fine young man at your side? Don't you recognise him, said Gwydion? He's your own son. Hush! Arianrod's smile disappeared. She dragged Gwydion to a quiet corner and demanded, Have you come here to make trouble for me? No, said Gwydion. I thought you'd be happy to see your son. Happy, snorted Arianrod with a curl of her lip. What's your boy's name? He has no name as yet, replied the wizard. Then he'll never have one, said Arianrod spitefully. Only his mother can give him a name, and I'm not going to do that, not ever. Gwydion couldn't believe his ears. You're a wicked woman, he called over his shoulder as he led his nephew away. The wizard was angry. A boy couldn't live without a name. Everyone would make fun of him. But Arianrod was right. Only a mother could name her son. Somehow or another, he would have to make her change her mind. The very next day, Gwydion took the boy down to the shore and wandered among heaps of seaweed at the water's edge. Out of one heap he conjured a sailing boat. Out of another he made the best and softest leather in the world. The wizard and the boy loaded the leather onto the ship, and together they sailed to Caer Arianrod. Along the way, Gwydion cast a spell to change their appearance so that no one would know them. From the window of her castle, Arianrod watched the approach of the ship and its crew. Who are those two men? she asked. They are two shoemakers, her servants replied. Look at the leather they have on board. It's shining like gold. Indeed it is, said Arianrod greedily. Measure my feet at once. I must have a pair of golden shoes. The servants measured their mistress's feet and took the order to Gwydion. But instead of following the measurements, Gwydion made the shoes which were far too large. The shoes fell off Arianrod's feet. These are no good, she grumbled to her servants. Go and ask for a smaller pair. The servants hurried back to the ship. This time they returned with shoes that were far too small. I suppose I'll have to go down to the ship myself, said Arianrod with a grunt of annoyance. I must have a pair of golden shoes. Arianrod marched down to the shore and boarded the ship. The old shoemaker measured her feet, while his little fair-haired companion played with a heap of pebbles. When a wren landed on the ship's mast, the boy flicked a pebble that struck the bird on its leg. "'What a good shot!' called Arianrod to the boy. "'You're the real Llew Llaw Guffis!' Ha Arianrod recoiled in dismay. Before the words were out of her mouth, the shoemaker and his assistant had begun to change shape. The ship vanished, leaving her stranded on a bed of seaweed. Beside her stood Gwydion and the boy who was her son. Ha <laughs> ha, said Gwydion once more. You've just named your son Cleo Clau Gruffis. And he smiled at the boy. The fair-haired lad with a skilful hand. That's the name your mother has given you. You couldn't ask for better. Cleo Clau Gruffis. The boy laughed with delight. But Arianrod flew into a rage. You've tricked me, she shouted at her brother. But I shall have my revenge, I promise you. This boy shall never carry arms unless I arm him myself. And I don't intend doing that, not ever. 
the gravel flew beneath her feet as she made her way back to the castle. Gwydion and the boy went on to Dinas Din Llyw and made their home there. Llyw grew into a handsome lad. He was an excellent horseman, but unlike his friends, he couldn't bear arms, and this made him very unhappy. Cheer up, said Gwydion to him one day. Tomorrow you and I are going on an errand. The next day Gwydion and Llyw rode to Caer Ariandrod, and before they reached the castle, Gwydion cast a spell that turned them both into young men, though the wizard looked a little older than Llyw. We are two poets from Glamorgan, Gwydion told the porter at the castle gate. Tell your mistress that we have come to entertain her with stories and stongs. Ariandrod welcomed them joyfully. A banquet was laid out in the hall, and after the meal was over, Gwydion told his stories. He was an excellent spinner of tales. Ariandrod's eyes gleamed in the firelight as she listened to him. That night, Gwydion and Llyw slept at the castle. While it was still dark, Gwydion rose from his bed and summoned his magic powers. By daybreak, there was a blaring of trumpets, followed by loud wails that made the very walls of the castle shake. Ariandrod ran to warn her guests. We're under attack, she cried. A fleet of ships is approaching. What shall we do? Gwydion looked down at the rows of ships beneath the castle walls. Make sure the doors and the gates are shut, and then get ready to fight with your life, he said. My friend and I would fight with you, but we have no weapons. I'll find you weapons, promised Ariandrod, hurrying away. She returned with two maids, who brought arms for each guest. There's no time to lose, said Gwydion. My lady, would you please arm my friend while your maids assist me? Yes, of course, said Arianrod, and she took the weapons from a maid, placed a helmet on Cleo's head, put a shield in his left hand and a sword in his right. The moment she let go of the sword, the noise died away. Arianrod looked out of the window. The sea was calm, and there were no ships in sight. Where have they gone? she cried. They were never there, replied a familiar voice. The two poets had disappeared. In their place stood her brother, Gwydion, and her son, Cleo, with a sword and a shield in his hands. I've been tricked again, said Arianrod. She clenched her fist. I've armed my son, she spat, but I tell you this, he shall never have a wife. He shall never marry any woman from any family on this earth. Gwydion bowed his head sadly. This time he was unsure what to do. Gwydion went to see Lord Math and told him what had happened. Math was dismayed at the cruel behaviour his maid. He was fond of Llyw. If Llyw can't marry any woman from any family on this earth, he said, then we must make a wife for him. We are both magicians, so why don't we gather wild flowers and turn them into a beautiful young woman? A wife made of flowers? What could be better? Math and Gwydion gathered the flowers of the oak and the broom and the meadow sweet. They were dainty and bright and scented the air. Gwydion cast a spell, and from these flowers he made a wife for Llyw. She was as pretty as the flowers, and her name was Blodowith. Llyw fell in love with Blodowith as soon as he saw, set eyes on her, and they were married soon afterwards, and set up court in Mur Castell, where Math had given them land and castle. Llyw ruled over his estate with great care. He enjoyed his new life, and his servants admired him. But Blodowith was less happy. The wildflowers were stirring in her blood and making her restless. One day, when Llo had gone to see Math, Blodowith was standing miserably at her window. Life was so boring. Llo was never at home. Every day was as dull as the next. In the midst of her sighs, she heard the sound of a horn. A stag ran past the castle, followed by a pack of hounds and men on horseback. Blodowith called her servant. Who were the hunters? she asked. Gronor Pebir and his friends, the man replied. Gronor Pebir is the lord of Penllyn. Late that night, Blodowith saw Gronor Pebir return. Invite him in, she told the servant. Llaw would never let a nobleman pass by his gate without offering him food. The servant took the message to Gronor Pebir, who gladly accepted. Thank you, my lady, he said to the beautiful young woman who was waiting to greet him. Her yellow hair, as bright as broom flowers, took his breath away. Blodowith prepared a banquet for her guest, and throughout that night she and Gronor talked and laughed together. He was such excellent company that Blodowith could not bear to see him go. She loved him already. 
So Grono stayed for three days and three nights, till it was time for Cleo to return. And by that time he too had fallen in love, and plotted with Blodawith to kill her husband. When Cleo arrived home, he noticed his wife was very quiet. What's the matter? he asked. I'm worried about you, said Blodawith in a small voice. I'm so afraid you'll die before me. If that happened, I'd be heartbroken. It won't happen, replied Cleo firmly. How can you say that? asked Blodawith. Because it's not easy to kill me, said Cleo, patting her arm. You see, I can only be killed by a brand new spear, and no ordinary spear at that. The man who makes it must work on the spear every Sunday for a year. But what if there is such a spear? Blodawith quavered. Clow smiled. Even if there is, he said, I can't be killed inside a house nor outside. I can't be killed on horseback either, and I'm perfectly safe if my feet are on the ground. Goodness, said Blodowith, you're a lucky man. I am indeed, said Cleo. In fact, there's only one way I can be killed. If a tub were to be placed on a river bank, beneath a roof of twigs, and if I stood with one foot on that tub and the other on the back of a billy goat, then a special spear could kill me. Goodness, replied Blodowith, then you're perfectly safe. But Cleo wasn't safe at all. That very night, Blodowith sent a message to Gronor Peber, telling him exactly how to kill her husband. Grono cut a stout branch, and every Sunday for a whole year he worked on the spear that would kill Cleo. When the spear was ready, he sent a message to Blodowith and hid on a nearby hill. Blodowith went in search of her husband, who just returned from a visit to Gwydion. Cleo, she said, do you remember telling me that story about the tub and the billy goat? I still can't quite understand what you meant. Could you show me? Of course, said Cleo. I'll do it now. So Blodowith ordered her servants to place a tub on the bank of the river Cunvale, beneath the roof of twigs, and then the goats were brought down from the hills and one billy goat placed beside the tub. When all was ready, Cleo jumped onto the edge of the tub and stood one-legged. Now watch, he said to his wife. I have one foot on the tub and I'm going to place the other on the animal's back. With that, he stretched his left foot towards the goat. At that very instant, Gronor Peber got to his feet and hurled the deadly spear. No sooner had Cleo's foot touched the animal's back than the spear pierced him through the middle. With a terrible screech of pain, the young man turned into an eagle and flew into the woods on faltering wings. Without a backward glance, Blodowith took Grono Peber's hand and led him to Mur Castell. I am now the lord of this castle, said Gronor. Yes, said Blodowith to the servants. Gronor Peber is now your master. Gwydion was worried sick. He hadn't heard from Cleo for many a long month. I don't know where he is, said Math. He's disappeared. Then you must search till you find him, urged Math. Gwydion went away. He searched through Gwynedd and Powys, but he couldn't find Cleo. At last he came to a house in Arvon, where he found a bed for the night. The owner of the house kept pigs. As night fell, a huge sow strolled onto the yard. The servant was waiting at the pigsty, and when she was safely inside, he closed the gate after her. That's a strange sow, said the owner to Gwydion. Every morning, as soon as the gate is open, she rushes off, and she doesn't come back till nightfall. I've no idea where she goes. Gwydion's magic wand quivered in his hand. Tomorrow, make sure I'm up before you open the sty, he told the servant. I'm going to follow that sow. Early next morning, the sow trotted out of the sty and made her way to the Nantleu Valley with the wizard at her heels. And when she reached the valley, she re rushed towards a, the oak tree and began to snuffle underneath its branches. Gwydion crept closer. To his surprise, the ground was littered with scraps of rotten meat. The wizard peered up through the leaves and saw two sharp eyes staring back at him. On the topmost branch of the oak stood an enormous eagle. The bird opened its wings and showered Gwydion with scraps of prey. Gwydion shivered with excitement. Could that eagle be Cleo? He looked up at the bird and sang a verse of a song. Between two lakes that oak trees lies, darkening the vale and darkening the skies. Cleo, Cleo, we know it's true. It was the flowers did this to you. At the sound of his voice, the eagle gave a cry and flew halfway down the tree. Gwydion sang a second verse, and before it had ended, the bird had swooped to the lowest branch. When Gwydion sang a third verse, the bird flew to him. 
the wizard tapped him with his magic wand, and the feathers and the beak and the claws fell away, and in his arms lay Hlew Llau Guffys, as pale as a sheet and as weak as a lamb. Gwydion placed Llew on his horse and took him to Lord Math at his court at Cairdathel. The doctors of Gwyneth came to attend him, and he stayed at court for one whole year. By the end of that year, Llew was as strong as he'd ever been. I'm ready to regain my castle, he said to friends. Gronor Pebber will pay for this. Math called up the men of Gwynedd, and Gwydion himself led them to Mur Castell. Bordereth heard the sound of horses' hooves. Hugh's coming! Hugh's coming! she cried, and she ran from the castle, taking her maids with her. Bordereth fled towards another castle on the far side of the valley, but she couldn't outrun the horses. She and her maids looked over their shoulders in panic, and by doing so failed to see the deep lake that lay in their path. The maids fell headlong into the water and drowned. Only Blodowith was left alive. Blodowith kept on running, till she felt the warm breath of a horse on her neck. The shadow of the wizard hung over her. She screamed and her f- hid her face from him. Ha <laughs> ha, said Gwydion. I shan't kill you, Blodowith. I'll turn you into a bird of the night, and you'll be too ashamed to come out by day, and all the other birds will hate you. He struck Blodowith with his wand, and with a wailing cry of an owl, rose from the gown and hid deep in the branches of a tree. In the meantime, Gronor Pebir had fled back to Plenthlin. From there he sent Llau a message. I have done you wrong, Llau, he said. How can I make it up to you? Will you take will, will you take land, or gold, or silver? I want only one thing, was Llau's reply. I want to see you stand on the bank of the Canvile, in the very place where I stood when you hurled that spear at me. Grono could not refuse. He went to stand on the bank of the river Canvile, in the place where Hlew had stood. But first he placed a slab of rock on the bank to protect him. Hlew stood on the opposite hill and hurled his spear. Grono heard a whistle as it flew through the air, and then he heard nothing. The spear had shattered the rock and killed him stone dead. As Grano fell to the ground, an owl screeched in the woods. Gwydion turned to Lord Math. She was once so beautiful, he said sadly. How could flowers be so cruel? And that's the end of the four branches of the Mabinogion. I hope you enjoyed them.